All right, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, opposite me today, I have Brian Hogben. He's from Mission 35 Mortgages. Welcome to the show, Brian. Hey, thanks for having me, Henry. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, for those that might not know, like the people watching, can you explain a little bit about your background and how you got started with Mission 35 Mortgages? Yeah, uh, you know what? Mission 35 was like a passion of mine ever since I was a kid. Um, I always wanted to be uh, financially secure by the time I was 35. Um, and uh, so, you know, it was Freedom 55 back then. Uh, so then I was like, you know what? Frick that. I'm going to do it in 20 years sooner. Um, so, you know what? And it really started with my dad teaching me stuff back in the day, you know, simple stuff, you know, spend less than what you make you know, live reasonably within your means, that kind of stuff. So um, I grew up, got into finances, got into mortgages. I worked for a major bank for a bunch of years. Then uh, we opened up Mission 35, December 2016. And Mission 35 was really, um, it was when I paid off my mortgage. I paid off my mortgage by the time I was 35 years old. And um, unfortunately, my dad wasn't around to see it. He had died two years prior to acute myeloid leukemia. So uh, after achieving that major milestone of paying off my mortgage, I wanted to have sort of like a legacy uh, for him. And, yeah. and it was something that uh, it's uh, kind of one of those never ending goals. And it's really about teaching people about financial security, teaching them how to manage their biggest investment. And that is, uh, is your house. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I saw that on your website. I thought it was very inspirational. Um, and, you know, I I'm, I'm happy that you had a chance to kind of share that with the people. Um, Thanks, Henry. Things are kind of going a little crazy right now. Obviously, um, the world's turning totally. sideways. Um, how has that affected your business? How are you finding it difficult for people to, you know, get a mortgage right now? Um, how do you find that working? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know what, like when COVID-19, this pandemic, you know, started, I think, uh, like a lot of us, I remember the end of March, we closed the office, everybody moved home, you know, it was the zombie apocalypse, right? Like, I wasn't yeah. sure what the hell was going to happen, right? There was a lot of fear and uncertainty in the world. So, um, you know, how has it affected our business? At first, it, it was really scary, right? Because, you know, uh, we teach people about investing in real estate, how many people were not going to pay their mortgage, there was deferrals, there was, you know, uh, landlords aren't going to get rent now, like there's a lot of fear there. So I think we saw a little bit of uncertainty for two months, you know, in that sort of March, end of March, April, May. But ironically enough, in June, it was just almost like all that pent up demand just went crazy and our and our business mm -hmm. has actually been you know fortunate we're actually up now uh almost 20 percent as of the end of august where we were in 2019 so i would say from you know people getting mortgages and buying houses that is good the challenge right now is that it's an extremely compliant environment so, you know, when it talk, when you talk about getting your T's crossed and your I's dotted, making sure you have all your, your pay information, uh, banks are still lending money. They're lending more money than ever before, but they are scrutinizing it more than ever before too, which I think is, is as much as I hate it and it pisses me off a little bit, um, people just have to remember that it's reasonable because if, if you can go out and get a mortgage tomorrow, and we were living in this environment for a while, if you can go get a mortgage tomorrow, and then defer it the next day, a bank's going to be a little bit more conservative about lending in the money. They want to make sure that you're going to take it and pay for it. So it is possible. The money train is moving, but they are asking more questions now today than, than ever before, I would say. Okay. So what advice for young people would you have? Like I'm, I'm a young person. Let's like, hypothetically speaking, I'm a young person. I want to buy a house, you know, I was in a good situation. I thought before everything went sideways, you know, now the world's kind of turned upside down. What's your advice to me to sort of position myself in the best possible way to get a mortgage as a, a first time great. home buyer? That's a great question. I love that because uh, we, we, we do a lot of first time buyers. We specialize in them. Uh, we actually had our youngest client at 19 years old buy a house this year as well too, which was super nice. cool. I think the first step is talking to a mortgage broker, preferably one at Mission 35, shameless plug, okay? But talk to okay. a mortgage agent because 
we will tell you what's wrong with your credit. We will tell you what you need to do. Like if you are worried and a lot of times, you know, it's really cool, Henry, to see, I see a lot of young people who think that they can't do it because of messages in the media and things that they hear and they come in and they're like, holy shit, I can do it. I can buy a house. I think some of the, the first thing you do is get pre-approved and with a good mortgage lender, like good professionals, if you're not pre-approved, a plan will be put in place, right? And if it's not going to work today, that doesn't mean like, don't lose hope because mm -hmm. I think, and number one, or number two, I would say one of the biggest mistakes I see some people making is waiting. Okay. I'm going to wait till the bubble bursts. I'm going to wait. Like if you said in March or April, I'm going to wait till the pandemic's over to buy a house. It actually turns out that March and April was probably one of the best times to buy a house because there wasn't competition. Prices flatlined for a little bit. And now if you waited till June, July, August, September, now you're in competition. So don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. I know that's cheesy. I got a lot of cheesy lines, but do it. Like do it now, do it today. Don't wait and don't let the fear of thinking that I can't qualify stop you. Like I'd rather you know what's wrong so we can tell you what's right. I like that you mentioned pre-approval. There's a lot of like stigma around that. Like I've, as an agent myself, I've worked with a lot of younger people um, and there's a lot of, misinformation out there, like you said. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, apps and stuff get pre-approved in five minutes. Like, oh. what does that really mean? Um, you know, I learned very quickly in the business that, you know, not all pre-approvals are created equal. Right. Um, I, I agree. That's a, a big point there. And like, cause I see a ton of the 60 second pre-approval. Like it's like, you know, it's like five minute abs, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, <laughs> but, anything good takes time. Right. Um, well, it doesn't usually come easy. Like you got to think the kids, and get it done. Right. So, yeah. And I think people need to realize that because the, we call them the difference for people to know is a pre-approval versus a pre-qualification. Okay. And the big thing for people to know is that if you're getting pre-approved in a minute or five minutes, nobody's looked at your paperwork. Okay. And I call it garbage in garbage out. If I go to an app and I say, I make $80,000 a year, do I really make 80 or is that what I tell my friends I make, or do I make 75,600 and I rounded it up to 80 or do I make $80,000 and some of it's commission, some of it's bonus, some of it's overtime, all those different questions go into the pre-approval process. So the big difference just for, for your listeners out here too, is if nobody asked you for verification documents, you don't have a pre-approval. You have a pre-qualification and that is no good in my eyes. No good at all. A pre-approval takes time and the lender needs to see your documents. You've got to see the paperwork because people getting pre-approved are not mortgage lenders. They don't know what needs to be looked for or asked. It's, it's a very good point. Like you hear horror stories all the time of people going in with no conditions, thinking they're pre-approved, you know, their agents either inexperienced or new or, you know, um, is kind of pushing them for their own benefit. Um, that's kind of something that I, I've heard horror stories of. Um, have you ever had anybody bring you um, a situation like that where you've kind of had to approve them quickly? Like how long does it typically take? <coughs> oh, that's a great approved. Like, you know, all things created equal. It's right. a great question. And, and you know what, I, I wish that this wasn't the case, but at Mission 35, we will get a minimum of three to five of those a week. Okay, a week of people that walked into a bank, thought they were pre-approved. And when push came to shove, like you said, they're not. And luckily at a brokerage, a lot and a lot of times they're not pre-approved because they said they made that $80,000 a year and they didn't. Right. So, and usually the solution on our end, luckily, um, and the other benefit to brokerages over banks on that is because there's multiple lender options. You've got 30 different institutions, at least that you can look at as a mortgage agent. So if it doesn't fit in the bank space, a lot of times it'll work. And with a credit union or a trust company, the banks have very, very regimented guidelines right now. So, um, we, we see this kind of stuff. And the horror story is really like, we have one where uh, a lady ended up purchasing a house she, and the client and the bank said, you're totally pre-approved. But what they forgot to say is that you're totally pre-approved 
so long as you sell your house, oh, right? Wow. That's a big, big, a big condition mess. there. Yeah. So, she, and, 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 you know, it didn't get caught by the agent. She got along well, long and long and short of it. She didn't sell her house. The closing date came, we were able to give her a private mortgage. Okay. Because she was on uh, an income that didn't justify carrying two mortgages. There was no way to make it qualify, but because there was a lot of equity or down payment there, we were able to make it work, but it ended up costing her tens of thousand dollars more than what she was expecting. And it's all because she had, uh, she didn't get good advice there. She didn't get the advice from someone to say, this is the terms and conditions of your pre-approval. Yeah, the advice is key. So, you know, I have a good relationship with my bank. Um, a lot of people do. What's the difference between what a bank gives you and what a broker can do for you. I find that there's a lot of confusion, you know, um, first time home buyer, you know, their mom and dad are, are uh, you know, in tight with the, with the lady at the bank and they go in there and they get this rate and, and everybody thinks it's great and, 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 and everything like that. Like what, what does a mortgage broker kind of add on to that scenario that is a benefit to the person looking to get a mortgage and, you know, how does a mortgage broker approach the process of finding the right solution versus what the bank does? So it's a really great question there. Uh, and what I would say, Henry, is like, it's, I equate it to banks are like order takers, whereas okay. mortgage agents and brokers are advice givers. Mom and dad walk into the bank with their kids and yeah, I love my lady there. And they say, you know, little Brian wants to buy a house and put down 10%. How does it work? They will type it all in and do the pre-qualification and get it, right? Yeah. Whereas if they walk in and see us, for example, what we're going to say is, hey, listen, did you know that there's a difference between putting 10% down and 20% down? You know, if mom and dad are coming in, we can explain, we can explain to them the savings that if they put down 20%, maybe they gift little Brian an extra 10% and he gets to save eight, nine, $10,000 on a Canada mortgage and housing insurance premium. So really the difference between going into, that's one I think is between the bank and us is that you're gonna get better advice. The second one is, cause I used to work at a bank and I didn't know what I didn't know. And if the bank didn't have a product, it was just a no. It's yeah. not try this or try, it's just no. Does Brian qualify? No, he doesn't. Okay, guess home ownership, it just ain't in the cards, Brian, right? Yeah. But if you go to a mortgage agent, if the banks say no, and the banks have great rates right now, let's say it's 2%, well, maybe Brian fits into um, a different lender's criteria, and maybe Brian pays 3.5%. Well, 1.5% higher on a mortgage is sure, as, is, in my eyes, a hell of a lot better than missing out on 5% appreciation in the market over the next Absolutely. year. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. and I think people, people don't make that correlation sometimes. So how, how often would you say, you know, people are going that bank route and not really testing to see what else is available to them? Like, like, would you say that's a high percentage of people in Canada or like, how does it kind of look on your end? Like, like, are you seeing a lot of people you know, highly informed on, on the process or does everybody seem like they're yeah. a little bit uninformed? That's a good point. And you know what, I'd be, I'd be hard to gauge. And I would end up saying, I think I, I would say just from our perspective here, the uh, it, it's, it's a little bit sad, I think in the sense, because I don't think they're very well prepared and their perceptions are wrong. Right. Because I think the perception, especially for young home buyers today is I'll never own a home or it's too expensive to buy a home or the market's so inflated right now, or I can't qualify. Like, I think there's a lot of negativity out there and some of it, you know, it is harder to qualify and homes are more expensive than ever. But I'll, the best quote I ever hear was from a builder. And he ended up saying, he goes, I've never seen homes as expensive as they are right now. And he goes, and I've been saying that since I was 20. Yeah, absolutely. this guy was in his 60s. So no matter how old you are, no matter where you're at, you're probably going to look and say, shit, things are expensive right now. So 
to me, that's not a reason not to get into the market, right? And for people getting misinformed at the bank, and it's hard, I think for a lot of kids today or a lot of people getting into the housing market, it's deflating hearing no. Because I think it takes a lot of courage to go in and apply for a mortgage sometimes because everybody's already telling you, you're not going to get approved. So by the time you go in and if you go in and talk to the wrong banker and they, it's like crushing your dreams, like no way, nope, you're not doing it. But that's not the case because you don't have someone educated in all the different avenues that might be possible for you to get financing. So Absolutely. It's interesting that you say that. So um, before I got into real estate, I, you know, got my first mortgage, you know, um, no and no and no over and over and over again for probably about a year. Um, I remember, um, you know, we got some feedback from a real estate agent um, after we had been out and looked at some homes, right? Um, and he said, you know, you, here's, your situ- here's your situation. Here's what I recommend you do, right? We didn't have a lot of money saved. You know, we're young people. It's tough. What do you do, right? I remember we walked into a bank and got a zero down mortgage yes. and didn't even know that was possible. Um, yeah. if, if the agent hadn't, hadn't had suggested that to us. Right. And I remember being shocked. I remember, you know, um, when you're young, nobody wants to give you anything. Nobody wants to help. You know, um, once you have a house, you have equity, you know, it's amazing how the skies open up and everybody just oh. starts throwing money at you. <laughs> and that's, that's the true. perception. I had, right? Like, you know, yeah. like you want a $10,000 line of credit? No problem. Here you go. Like it's, the, it's the amount of effort involved was like so minimal, right? But when you have no assets, life is very hard, right? Um, yeah. I, I remember when I got into real estate several years ago, um, the government had phased out those zero down mortgages. Um, right. Is that something mm-hmm. that's still on the table? Um, like although not maybe as, as readily available as it was when, when I took advantage of it, is that something that, you know, under the right circumstances, somebody might be able to utilize? And if so, what are those circumstances? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's a great point, you know, um, with zero down mortgage, it's funny you say that because my first mortgage was a zero down mortgage too. Welcome I remember to the that. Club. My- Welcome to the club. My, my mission 35 house, the one that I sold to uh, yeah. pay off my house, like I sold, like I'm an investor as well too. And I sold a house to pay off the house I live in. It started as a zero down mortgage at 6.75%. Zero down at 6.75. And the house, I bought it for 165000 back then and ended wow. up selling it for 475000 So I, I just say that because, and then that equity was enough to pay off my house but after 10 years, of course. But when it comes down to zero down today, uh, they're not readily available, right? It is much more difficult today. However, there are certain lenders that will allow you to use the borrowing from an unsecured source to use that as a down payment for your house. Okay. Okay? Can you elaborate before we go any further on what an unsecured source is? Yeah, you got it. So let's say you have a line of credit or a line of credit. It's like a really big visa card with a big limit with a relatively lower rate. Okay. Okay. So if you were able to qualify for a line of credit at a bank for say 20, 25, $30,000. Okay. Which is not the easiest feat in itself. Right. Um, Because (laughs) you reminded me of what, uh, what we say about banks, like they'll give you an umbrella when it's not raining. (laughs) <laughs> and then when it starts raining, they'll say, give me that umbrella back. We need that absolutely, back. Absolutely. It's kind of like, it's kind of like credit with them. And anyways, I digress. Um, but what the banks will say is if you incorporate, and this is not all banks and all lenders, but we have some niche lenders that will say is, okay, if that payment on that $30,000 unsecured line of credit <clears throat> is $300 a month, if your ratios or affordability necessitates that you can afford that payment, they will allow you to borrow that down payment included in all of your monthly payments in order to qualify for it. So I'll give it a numbers example, just uh, because there'll be a little more concrete. If you bought a house for 500,000, 5% down be 25,000, okay? So let's say on 500, if 500 minus the 25, you'd have a mortgage of 475 plus your CMHC premium. Let's say that payment is gonna equate to $2,000 a month for simple math, okay? 
Okay. If you borrowed the $25,000 from that line of credit I was talking about, and if that payment was say $300 a month, you would be paying the mortgage for 2000 and the line of credit where you borrowed it from 300. So you're, you'd be borrowing 100% of the value, but you would have two payments that you're paying to do it. Okay, there we Does that go. Make sense? Yep, yeah, 100%. Um, and on that point too, like just because I find like um, one of my favorite quotes is that there's never a lack of resources, there's only a lack of resourcefulness. Okay. And I believe that when it comes down to, if you say no with the bank, what we're seeing more and more and more of is co-investing. Right. And I think for young first time home buyers who hear a lot of no's and the zero down won't work. And maybe I don't have a lot of assets, right. Is can you save up, you know, a little bit of money and do it with four of your friends? And the answer is yes, you can right? Four of you could get together and all pitch in five, six, seven thousand $7,000, right? And do it. Or what we're also seeing a lot of, I've got a young daughter, she's four years old. Nothing I would love to do more is invest with my daughter, right? So I think instead of mom and dad co-signing right now, we actually teach a lot of, you know, first time home buyers who've heard a lot of no's, put a business plan together, and yeah. get mom and dad to buy the house with you. And maybe it's a five-year plan. And maybe mom and dad are now business partners with you. And maybe you sell that house after five years, split the equity and say, see you later, mom and dad. Now I got my money and you got yours. And we both made some money here. Exactly. And it might benefit them depending on what stage of their life they're in too, to kind of have that chunk of money coming back to them. Right? Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. As we kind of, you know, get into that area. Like a lot of people don't understand that, you know, what are the requirements for CMHC? When does that kind of, you know, kick in? Um, can you kind of explain a, what CMHC is, what the yeah. requirements are, um, you know, what your recommendations are about avoiding it if you can, um, yeah. like what are your general thoughts on CMHC? That's a really good question. You got good ones, Henry. I appreciate it. These are, and this is good knowledge because I think there's a lot of miscommunication out in the marketplace. You know, uh, I used to, when I first started uh, doing mortgages, I used to explain CMHC is a huge fee for what feels like nothing. <laughs> okay. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, people wouldn't ask any more about it. But uh, the reality is so, so number one, the requirements with CMHC have gotten stricter over the years. Number one is, um, you can only do a 25 year amortization, the life of the mortgage, if you put down less than 20% of a house. So just for simple math, if you're buying a house for 500,000, if you put down less than a hundred, that's 20%, you would have to have Canada mortgage and housing, which is mortgage default insurance. What that is, it's a big cost that goes on top of your mortgage. And what it does is it provides insurance for the bank, okay? So essentially what it means is that if you buy a house with less than 20% down, decide not to pay it, move to Mexico because the pandemic's over and say, screw this, I'm celebrating the next coronavirus for the corona, okay? Exactly, the tacos are better there. Yeah, I would <laughs> think they are right now, oh my God. Yeah. Um, then the bank is protected. So CMHC will then protect the bank from default. So that's why you're paying that fee. The benefit to what people don't, you know, sometimes realize is that's why banks are able to lend money because it's insured. It's essentially guaranteeing that loan for the bank is what Canada Mortgage and Housing does. Now, the benefit to Canada Mortgage and Housing is you can put down, if you're qualified, less than 20% which is great because 20% is a ton of money for a lot of people. What's um, the lowest you can put down? Just hmm. people, people. 5%. Kind of 5%. If, well, so there's a tier. If you're purchasing a house for $500,000 or less, it's 5%. So that'd be 25,000. Anywhere from 500,000 to 999,000, it's 5%. I'd love how the government makes things really easy. Okay. But I, yeah, they're great. it's going to be, <laughs> 5% on the first 500,000 and then 10% of anything from 500 to a million. So if you bought a house for 600,000, 
you'd have to pay the 5% on 500, which is 25. I feel like I need a blackboard for everybody here. Okay. Yeah, maybe a little bit. And then 10% on the additional 100. So that'd be 10. So your actual down payment's 35,000 instead of, so it's like, works out to like six, six and a half when you're so between. So it's not as cut and dry as just, you know, 5%, the whole thing. You and go. you know what? It's a great point because again, you walk into a bank, like here's a big f in my eyes, right? Sorry, but it's like, if you go into a bank and you say, oh, I'm pre-approved for 600,000 and the bank says, yeah, 5% down. That's a different, it's not 5% down. It's a little bit more than 5%. And it's like, nothing is worse than having to come up with an extra thousand or $2,000 that you're not expecting when you're excited and purchased a house. So it's really Especially sure right, right now, there's not a whole lot of, you know, piles of money lying around. People yeah. are, are, you know, times are a little tighter right now, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I not agree. that it was easy before, um, yeah. but definitely a little bit more difficult now, right? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think one of the benefits, so once you don't have to put down 20%, so this is where things get a little bit creative and, and you can open up. So, you know, for anybody looking to buy a house, if you had some credit issues or you're self-employed or you're starting a side hustle and it, the income's not verifiable yet, the 20% down number is kind of a magic number because now all of a sudden other lenders open up. The banks don't have to have Canada mortgage and housing insurance anymore. Typically, there's some different rules and regulations, but that's for a phone call afterwards that we could talk yeah. about. Um, but with 20% down, now I can go over 30 years. Now there's a little bit more leniency because now trust companies, credit unions, and we call them alternative lenders who aren't banks, because there's a lot of equity in there, they start to, I don't want to say overlook certain rules and policies, but they'll work with things differently. If you had some bad credit, oh, well, instead of you getting your 2% rate, we realize you had some bad credit, but because you have a big down payment, we'll give you the money, but at a higher rate of maybe one or 2% more, but only for let's say a one year term, because we'll give you some time to clean stuff up. And then at the end of the year, you can go to a bank or go somewhere else. So is that why it's important to kind of work with somebody like yourself? Because to me, that kind of sounds like a, like a strategy. So like a long-term goal, you know, maybe I'm only in this mortgage for a year. What's my end goal? Um, you know, I would think, uh, you know, as a young person, if that was the route I was going, it would be good to sit down with somebody and kind of map out what my expectations are on the back end, you know, just to, to sort of have an eye on where I plan to be. Right. Yeah, um, I, I agree. It's uh, it's the biggest investment of your life, right? Like it's like to sit down and have the total, like we tell people we want to be your mortgage advisor for life. This isn't a transaction. This is like, you know, this is a, your biggest investment. It's like you talk to your financial if you had a five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars sitting in a bank, you'd be talking to your financial planner every every couple of months, right? Yeah. Or every I would every hope year. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and why not with your mortgage? Like you have a five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar asset sitting there. You, you want to have some strategy and some communication about what to do with it. It's a it's a big, big, big investment. And I think having that that's one of the things we love to to give people on as we, you know, it's what's your mission? Where do you want to be? When do you want to be mortgage free? Right? Because working with the end in mind, how do you want to get there? Well, there's prepayments, there's other things you can do, making sure you get the right interest rate. So where do you want to go? And I think sometimes everybody thinks the first scenario is going to be perfect. You're going to get a bank mortgage, but it's just not the case. Right? And I think more and more, I would say almost 50% of our business today uh, doesn't fit with the bank but it still fits with a lender. That's really good. But it's like having that plan to say, yeah, you're paying three or 4% today instead of 2%. But guess what? If you do ABC, if you end up paying off a little bit of debt, right? If you end up declaring a little bit more money on your income taxes, because you're self-employed and you're putting more cash in your pocket, but maybe if you put a little more on your T1 general, your notice of assessment, we can yeah. move you. To balance rest. it out a little bit. Right. Um, yeah. Just before I let you go here, um, you know, when I was young, I thought all, all mortgages, all lending kind of went through a bank. Um, when we talk about alternative lenders, um, can you dig a little deeper into what that is for people? Um, yeah. You know, what, like, what are the options? I know a lot of people just assume that 
you're going to have to deal with some major institution. Um, yeah. And that's not, by my understanding, always the case, right? Yeah. And, and I think the misconception out there is twofold. Number one, you have to deal with a major institution. Number two, if you go to a mortgage broker, you're a deadbeat. It's like almost like we were used car salesmen. Like we're in this, mm -hmm. not that there's anything wrong with that profession. Okay. <laughs> but they kind of had a stigma. I'm going to get a it. bunch of emails. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I, that's just a terrible, but Hey, we're, we had that same stigma for a while. Right. Where it's like, Oh, you only go to a mortgage broker and this is going back in time. But I think this is sometimes those preconceptions that parents might give to their kids where if you're going to a mortgage broker, they're going to charge you big fees and they're really expensive. Well, that does happen in some cases, but I would say that's probably less than 5% of the time when that happens. Okay. That has to be a situation where someone's in a, in a jam, like someone is losing their house. They didn't pay their mortgage for months, right? Like those situations can get expensive, but going to a mortgage broker and dealing with alternative lenders, okay? They don't have to abide by the bank act, okay? They have different rules and regulations. And a lot of times they're only one or two points higher, right? So I think that misconception is you're gonna pay so much more. And I think it's comparing things and it's about progress because if I can't get approved with a bank at 2% today, that does not mean I should wait until I can get approved, okay? And I've seen numerous examples and I could probably give you one for every single year for the past five years. If I waited to buy a house in 2017, well, my pre-approval got reduced later in the year because the first stress test came out. Mm -hmm. If I waited in 2018, well, amortizations changed again, right? There's always a reason, right? If I waited until the pandemic was over, and I was going to be pre-approved in March and I waited till it was over. Well, now real estate in a lot of areas is 10 to 15% higher. Absolutely. It doesn't routinely go down. It routinely goes up. Right. I, and I think like, I'm a big buy, buy and hold, like hold on to the long term kind of person. But what I, I guess my point is, is that even if you're paying one to two percentage points higher on a mortgage, right? Let's say it's $500,000. And this is where I get a little nerdy and I hope that's okay. Two points higher on a 5% mortgage is gonna cost you 10 grand a year, right? Two points on five is $10,000 extra. That's a lot compared to imagine in a, in a healthy market real estate, let's say it goes up by 3% in a year, which I think is very conservative on a long-term trajectory, but let's say Absolutely. three. 3% 3 on 500,000 is 15,000, right? Not to mention on the average $500,000 mortgage, even if you're paying three to 5%, your mortgage is going to go down by eight to 10,000. So the difference in your wealth being super conservative here is anywhere from 23 to $25,000. Your house went up a little bit. The mortgage went down a little bit. Even if you're paying that higher rate, 25 grand minus let's say the 10 grand premium you paid at a higher interest rate, your still wealth is $15,000 higher. And I've seen, I've seen years where that gap has been 20, 30, 40, $50,000. So it's just, I, and I think that misinformation is I got to wait till I can get approved at a bank is bullshit. Because if you get approved now, buy now, like really. Exactly, exactly. And for the people out there, if that's your plan, let your agent know because they can put you in a situation to buy a house that's maybe going to appreciate a little quicker than, you know, something around the corner for various reasons, right? Like there's dozens and dozens of criteria that would kind of affect whether a house appreciates at a certain amount year over year. So if that's your goal to kind of, you know, um, really sort of rock that appreciation out of the park, in the first year, talk to your agent. Um, think about things you could do to the house um, to try and you know raise that appreciation. I just wanted to kind of get that in there um, at the end because because that is sort of part of the plan as well. Um, if you're going to do it, right? Um, I think too. It's just like just like no different than how we talked about having a, a mortgage person that wants to see you in the right trajectory. Same with a realtor. There's lots of realtors out there that'll treat you as a transaction. 
and you want someone that wants to see you grow, right? Like and by sh- sharing that plan with a great realtor, they can be your partner for life in that too. So absolutely. Um, you know, we're running a little bit on time here. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, if anybody had any questions for you, how could they get in touch with you? What's the best way to, to sort of reach you to kind of have those questions answered? Yeah, totally. Uh, you can actually email me. It's mortgages at brianhogbin.com. Uh, you can call the office 905-574-5255. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. You can DM me through my Facebook at Brian Hogbin or Instagram as well too. And what I was going to say too, if you don't mind, uh, I've got a couple books here for first time home buyers. Uh, ones that I've written, it's uh, how to get mortgage free really fast. Okay. Sorry if it's on loud with parents in the room at mission 35. Um, if anybody wants to email me and wants a copy of the book, I'm happy to send it to you for free. Okay. Just because, um, uh, I made a lot of mistakes trying to get into the housing market and trying to build up our business and that. And if you can, you know, make as many mistakes as I did and screw ups and still end up okay. Trust me. Like, I mean, if I can do that, you're good. So if you do want a copy of that, email me, reach out. I'm happy to send it out to you free of charge. 